I want to welcome you all to uh, the first panel we're having this evening. Uh, and we're going to be uh, talking and focusing on corporatization and privatization of community colleges. And um, what is, um, what had been a great program for working class people to go to community colleges in California is now being threatened by privatization and by online programs. And uh, in the case of San Francisco City College, we're here about their want to sell off land and, and basically destroy the college. Uh, there's a lot of land value properties involved here, making a lot of money. So um, our first speaker is going to be George Wright. George is uh, uh, formerly a professor at Chico State University and Skyline Community College and has been involved in fighting around privatization of education. He's a member of the steering committee of United Public Workers for Action. And he is, uh, took it up in, in the union, uh, his union, AFT, uh, to, to begin to educate. And that's one of the real problems of a lack of education. That's why we're having this, uh, this panel here. So our first speaker, George Wright, welcome. Okay, uh, thanks, Steve, uh, and uh, okay, thanks, Steve, and uh, honored to be on this esteemed panel with uh, John and Rick and Madeline. Uh, just a real quick introduction. Uh, I've been involved in public education for over 60 years, both as a student as well as a teacher. Uh, I've uh, went to uh, public high school, public uh, junior college. Uh, State College and also uh, took some courses at uh, UCLA and UC Berkeley and I taught at Cal State Chico for 34 years, taught political science as well as teaching at Skyline Community College in San Bruno where I taught history. So I think I have a pretty good institutional memory of uh, what has happened to higher education over the last uh, 40, 50 years. Uh, I'm going to try to do something a little different uh, tonight. Um, what I'd like to talk about is neoliberalism and the relationship of neoliberalism to public education. And uh, I, I, neoliberalism is a pretty clear concept, but a lot of people get uh, confused about what we mean by neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is... Uh, a version of classical liber liberalism, and uh, we should be familiar with uh, New Deal liberalism. So it's one of, uh, it's the third phase of the, of the history of liberalism. What we can say about neoliberalism is that it is a, uh, a hegemonic ideology. And what I mean by hegemonic ideology is that it is the dominant ideology of a given uh, society or a given historical block. Um, and it, maybe another way of putting it, it is the, the, how people see the world around them and how people interpret the world. Um, what I can also say about neoliberalism is that it is a manufactured ideology. And in fact, neoliberalism was more or less constructed in the 1970s to justify a restructuring of the United States and for that matter, the global political economy from uh, on one level from Keynesian economic mechanisms to monetarist or supply side economic mechanisms. And it was also aimed at redefining the relationship of individuals to uh, the state or to the government. Under corporate liberalism, uh, or what we know as New Deal liberalism, uh, the role of the government was to rectify, uh, uh, not only to manage the political economy, but also to provide, uh, uh, to respond to the excesses and the contradictions of capitalism. For example, the New Deal programs themselves, uh, the war on pover poverty, the civil rights uh, policies of the 1960s, et cetera, et cetera, where neoliberalism is just the opposite. It is aimed at uh, dismantling 
uh, Keynesianism uh, aimed at dismantling uh, the New Deal policies uh, that uh, Roosevelt started in the 1930s and that were uh, the centerpiece of American public policy uh, into the 1970s. Much of this uh, restructuring took place, started in the 70s, and it was uh, institutionalized by uh, the Reagan administration. Simultaneously, Margaret Thatcher in England was doing the exact same thing. Uh, what has happened since Reagan is that uh, both parties, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, has internalized neoliberalism and both parties are responsible for neoliberal policies, which we'll get a little clearer in the moment. Uh, what we mean by a hegemonic ideology is that uh, government rules not by coercion uh, necessarily, but it rules by consent. And what we mean by that is that the dominant classes pursue policies, neoliberalism at this instance, uh, to benefit uh, their corporate or profit making. But what they also do is they have the ability to inculcate or indoctrinate the subordinate classes and subordinate groups to buy into their ideology. Uh, for example, neoliberalism uh, c is committed to uh, cutting taxes for the wealthy. It's committed to deregulating the economy. It's committed to privatizing uh, the economy, and that's where we're, it's going to fit into our discussions about public education. Uh, it's committed to um, sacking or uh, uh, dismantling the public sector, and it's also committed to breaking unions as well. Uh, now, what we'd like to do is to use public education as a case study to see how neoliberalism has reimagined and restructured public education, but just as importantly, how people have internalized this project uh, as being normal. What I'm gonna to try to finish up with uh, real quickly is to propose that not only if we are opposed to the privatization and the corporatization of public education, we can not only just challenge privatization and corporatization, but we also have to destroy neoliberalism as a hegemonic ideology and construct what uh, Antonio Gramsci calls a counter hegemonic, uh, a counter he uh, ideology, excuse me, a counter hegemonic ideology to shape the world in a more humane, egalitarian, and principled manner. You guys kind of with me here? Okay, so what I'd like to do is more or less show you from my vantage point how neoliberalism looks at education. At the core of neoliberalism is that uh, everything should be market driven. Uh, if it doesn't benefit the market, then it, is, it doesn't work. Remember Margaret Thatcher said something called Tina? There is no alternative. Well, the, the neoliberalism practice is that there's no alternative to uh, a neoliberal world order. Uh, now, the first point I wanna make in general as to how neoliberalism looks at education, uh, from the vantage point of parents, uh, parents are forced to be entrepreneurs because they're making choices. Choice is a key word within the literature, the canon of neoliberalism. They're making choices to find the best schools for their children so their children have the best economic opportunity in life. From the vantage point of the policymakers, uh, the Congress, the President, the Secretary of Education in this instance, uh, Betsy DeVos, in the last, uh, uh, in the Obama administration, it was Arne Duncan. Uh, just to let you know, even though De DeVos, DeVos is horrendous, she's simply following and accelerating policies that the Obama administration, now pushed by Arne Duncan, were carrying out as well. This is an example how both parties succumb to uh, 
and practice neoliberal policies. Students, uh, from the vantage point of students, students look at what school is going to be more, most advantageous for them to have a, success, to have a successful career in life, i.e. to make the most money. From the vantage point of schools and school administrators, it's how to make, uh, to how to run a school like a business rather than a public institution. And from the vantage point of administra administrators, they do not look at themselves as educators, but they look at themselves as managers or CEOs. We can see that very clearly in the San Francisco Unified School District related to the Ar Arnatoff murals uh, in, uh, story, which, and we'll have a panel at 7.30 this evening on that. If you look at Superintendent Matthews and the school board, they don't, look, they don't act like educators, they act like managers and business people. Um, and certainly the superintendent looks at himself as a manager rather than an educator. Uh, what I'd like to do is to kind of walk through the, base, the various units that are related to uh, higher education and just make a few comments about how those units fit within the neoliberal world order. Uh, from the vantage point of the administrators, as I just said, they look at themselves as educational entrepreneurs. Um, they look at themselves as CEOs, CEOs. they look at themselves as managers. Uh, I would also add that some of these administrators, like Superintendent Matthews, are actually e economic hit men or women because they're assigned to go into districts like Oakland or Inglewood to uh, uh, fire people, uh, change the curriculum, introduce charter schools, et cetera, into the community. From the vantage point of faculty, and we have two faculty on our panel, uh, and uh, myself included, uh, what we see, uh, in, just very quickly, we see the expansion of adjuncts or part-time teachers on college campuses, uh, which means that uh, the administration is saving money. But at the same time, not only are the adjuncts, but also the full-time teachers are, are now super exploited workers. Um, whether it's uh, testing, assessment, student learning outcomes. I worked at Chico State when it was a state college or state university, and uh, I saw the changes from the 70s into the 80s and the 90s. Uh, when I started teaching there in the early 70s, um, all the, the mission was to teach, to be in the classroom. By the 90s, uh, faculty had to write books, had to get grants, and all the things that uh, university professors were required to do. But at the same time, state college faculty did not have the money, the resources, the teaching assistants, the time off, and, and the like. Uh, and the bottom line is I saw a lot of social ills and social problems emerge among the faculty and keeping in touch with some of the, the people on the plant that continues to this day. I do have to make a note about teachers. Uh, my general view of teachers, I have great respect for teachers who are fighting against this tide very strongly because many of them, if not all, are seriously dedicated to teaching and they do all that they can to circumvent the, uh, the assault that the neoliberal project is placing upon them. But at the same time, I would argue that the morale is very poor uh, from my observation. From the vantage point of students, how are students viewed from the neoliberal perspective? Are they looked at as, uh, as potential geniuses and contributions to humanity and the world? Uh, are, are they looked at as uh, people who uh, uh, need to self-actualize themselves and to find their full potential? No, they're viewed as human capital and human resources. Um, and the plight that students have is uh, uh, if you, you can have an education, um, if you can afford it, or if you're willing to go into enormous debt, where when 
I slash many of us here went to college in the 50s, 60s, and 70s in, the, in public education in California. It was free. When I attended community college, uh, the, the fees were $7.50. When I went to state college, I paid $47.50 a semester. Um, that is not the case in the last 15, 20, 30 years for public for kids. Now, obviously, debt benefits the banks and these uh, so-called fly-by-night financial payday lending firms as well. So that how, that's how it fits into the capitalist system. Maybe the most important element of this story is the nature of the curriculum, is that uh, the curriculum is constantly redefined, restructured, and, and uh, uh, undermined. And the basic premise of the, of, the, of the curriculum under a neoliberal perspective is, um, is that the curriculum is the primary site for building and formulating human capital, meaning to uh, uh, train students uh, to uh, become, okay, okay, goes fast, doesn't it? All right. Um, also, the, the curriculum is constantly being reimagined and restructured in line with changing economic demand. Now, that's always been the role of public education, but it's being intensified today in the framework of to preparing students for the 21st century skills so that the United States could be competitive within the global economy. That is what education is being forced to become. And that the emphasis is to de the emphasis is more on math, technology, engineering, the sciences, et cetera, and to de-emphasize the humanities and the social sciences. Um, and the third element of the curriculum is to standardize the curriculum, particularly in the social sciences and the humanities, which undermines the creativity, the critical thinking, and the revisionist and alternative vantage point and, and literature that teachers could provide for students uh, without this standardization. Um, and then finally, research for profit, particularly on the university level. Now related to unions, very quickly, uh, it's very simple. Unions of uh, mainstream unions have always been practicing what we call business unionism, going back to Gompers, where there's collaboration with the management or the owners of firms. What we can say is that this is only intensified and made more complex under neoliberalism. More specifically, what union bureaucrats uh, refuse to do is one, to educate its rank and file about the impact of privatization and corporatization, as well as it refuses to mobilize the rank and file to confront this neoliberal privatization, corporatization model. When you do see stu uh, teachers, and we've seen a number of teachers strike, go out on strikes in the last couple of years, most often when they go on strike, they're circumventing the union bureaucrats, and then the U union bureaucrats come in and try to undermine uh, the thrust of, of their project. Uh, to finalize all of this, as I said, the way to challenge this is not just go after policy, but at the same time, we have to challenge and create a new hegemonic ideology that promotes humanism, uh, egalitarian principles, and internationalism, sustainability, and you can add whatever else you want to the list. Thank you. Thank you, George. And uh, a document of his is, is available, we can get it out, that he's written on uh, privatization and corporatization of community colleges. So our, our next speaker is uh, Rick, Rick Baum, and Rick is a professor at uh, City College in San Francisco and has been engaged in a long struggle uh, at City College against privatization and uh, to protect the uh, college and also to protect adjuncts, uh, and he's a member of uh, AFT 2121. Welcome, Rick Baum. Thank you. Thanks for coming today. Uh, what I'm going to say probably dovetails a lot with what George said. I'm going to go from a different angle. I'm sorry, I may be repeating some of the same things he said. 
I want to look at education from the standpoint of capitalism and what capitalism seeks. I guess I've been reading the Bowles and Gintis book that was written in the 70s, and it's influencing me because they trace the relationship between capitalism and our education system going back from the beginning of the country and how the education system is seen as changing to accommodate the needs and interests of different business groups as business changes. It doesn't mean that there's a direct relationship between capitalism and our education system, but essentially our education system is there to serve the needs and interests of businesses, which is basically to, to train people to work in their industries so that they have the right skills and the right attitudes that business desires out of its workers. Uh, Keep in mind that capitalism contains many contradictions. You know, we're supposed to be a democratic society. In a democratic society, people are supposed to have equal power and participate in decision making. But when you work in the economy, our, econo our economic system is very authoritarian, very top down. People are expected to obey orders and certainly not participate in decisions about running the company. In a capitalist society, the goals and purposes of education, as I've already said, is to develop a workforce with certain attitudes and worldviews. And they include that are desired by business. Business needs people with certain levels of skills plus attitudes. And they generally mean accept, accepting being dominated and following orders of those above them. So that's partly what you're being taught in school. Being punctual, dependable, motivated, and compliant. And these are the goals of the, what you're trying to sh how you're trying to shape students to serve the capitalist system. It doesn't mean that that takes place. There are teachers who don't do these kinds of things and do just the opposite. Um, while many, most students are being trained to be workers, there are, it's a small number are being trained to be supervisors and managers. And at that very top, some are being trained to run the big businesses and to even own them. And it, what, what that reflects is our, the class nature of our society. So we're a class society, and the education system varies with people's social classes. So if I can cover K through 12 schools, if they're located in wealthy areas, the students in wealthy areas, whether it's public or even private schools, they have a lot more resources for their education. Why do they have more resources? Well, in part because they have more wealth, but they're being trained to enter college. It's just as assumed that you're going to be going to college when you go to one of those schools. I personally went to a school in a well-to-do community, and there's no question about going to college right after you graduate from high school. Whereas by contrast, if you're going to a school in a poorer area, first of all, there's fewer resources, there's a greater emphasis on discipline and obeying the orders, and there's fewer opportunities for advancement. Doesn't mean that some students don't advance. Some do advance and they overcome the obstacles in their way by growing up in a poor area. But in poor communities, the students are mainly being trained to accept menial jobs or to go into the military. I mean, that's, that's what the school is there for, to recruit people for the military. Uh, many of them will end up dropping out, and many of them, unfortunately, will end up going to prison. I mean, I guess you could say there's a nice side to that because it boosts our employment opportunities for cops, prosecutors, judges, parole officers, and prison guards. I mean, that's the way our, our system works. We have over 2 million people in prison right now. And I think in California, it's estimated about 55,000 a year per prisoner. I just can't. It's just unfathomable to me that that many resources going into keeping people locked up on a yearly basis. Despite the barriers to students from poor communities and the obstacles they face, um, many do experience upward mobility. They, they do overcome the obstacles. And I just would put it in terms of what I understand Marx to say is that a ruling class is always seeking new blood to reinvigorate its ranks. So they want people from lower strata of society to move upward. And that also allows people to say, oh, we are a society that allows for upward mobility and opportunities. And this, isn't this great that this poor lad you know, grew up in poverty and now he's a CEO of a corporation? Isn't, isn't America great? The kind of attitude that comes from that. Our higher educational institutions reflect our class structure. And I would just use California as the model, though I think this is much more universal. At the one level, you have community colleges. And 
different levels of colleges are training different levels of students. Community colleges, it's generally a place where working class students are being trained and those in the lower middle class. And they're getting prepared for lower level positions within the economy. Um, there are exceptions, and they would be especially the case for those community colleges located in wealthy communities. I once taught at DVC, Diablo Valley College, and to me it seemed to me that most of my students were rich kids who screwed up when they were in high school, and so they were going to DVC for a while, but the idea would be that they transfer to a four-year school afterwards. Chico State. Chico State's the same way, okay. <laughs> okay, um, you know, I, can, I teach a city college, and city college is predominantly working class students of color, I'd say is the bulk of the students attending there. And at the state college level, it's a little bit different. There you have middle class students, and those are transferred in from the community colleges, and they're being trained for more middle level positions in management, and th positions like that. At the universities and the private colleges, that's the training ground for the upper middle class and the upper class. And the purpose is to train the students attending there so that they're ready to take over and run the major institutions of our society. Um, or I once heard someone say at Harvard, you're, you're trained to own those institutions. Whereas maybe at UC Berkeley, you're trained to run them. Um, but what's probably more important to these types of colleges is not so much the education, it's the social networks and connections that you build up. So if you go to these very prestigious private colleges, you're gonna be attending with other kids who come from an upper class background and you're developing social connections early on that will help out in later life. That's one reason why so many of these rich people that we've been reading about are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to get their kids into a place like USC or an Ivy League school because their kids have mediocre back, they're mediocre students. They have no business going to those schools, but they get in by the parents spending all this kind of money because they're gonna build up the, social, the important social connections, which are so vital to them later in life. You're also at these higher level schools, you're training people in the top professions to be doctors and lawyers. Now, capitalism is always changing and George is laying out by talking about neoliberalism, what's been going on in the last, say, 40 or 50 years. Another thing about capitalism, and some may not buy into this, I find it fairly convincing, is it's fairly stagnant. It's been a stagnant system for maybe 40, 50 years. I, I read Monthly Review a lot, and that's their argument. And so one of the critical things about capitalism is how are we gonna make more money, especially if the system is stagnant? And they found a least short-term solution, which is privatization. And private, by what's meant by privatization means taking public funds and that are used by public institutions and contracting out to private for-profits or even non-profits, many activities that were previously done in-house. So previously, lots of activities were done by the public institution itself or by government employees. It's now being done by private businesses because it's a source of billions of dollars of how they can make more and more money. And we see the privatization in things such as, you know, many areas, prisons, they're being privatized. You have mercenary armies and mercenaries being used to provide security. I think that was the case for American officials when they went to Iraq. It wasn't done by American tr troops within the American Armed Forces. It was done by, or what was the name of that horrible outfit? Black, 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 yeah. Oh, I, 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 Blackwater, yeah, and they've changed their name. Um, we also find, and this is where the nonprofits come in, um, they provide social services. They're behind a lot of the schemes for what's supposed to be affordable housing, and they're often brought in on affordable housing projects to give cover. At City College, they want to build this massive 1,000 to 1,500 units on, the res on half the reservoir property, if you're familiar with it, by Avalon. And Avalon is smart. They brought in um, Habitat for Humanity and one other group, and they'll get a few units and they'll say, you know, this is a good project because we're going to be building housing for poor people, but in the meantime, they're going to be displacing all the working class students who attend City College, none of whom will be able to afford any of this housing. So it's, it's just ludicrous. Other forms of privatization is contracting out with private companies to run computer systems, even to provide janitorial, food, 
food, medical, and maintenance services. And then there's the big one of charter schools. This is another example of that. Some are nonprofit, so I guess they're supposed to be better compared to the for-profit ones, but they're all pretty wretched. Um, what's happening in the community colleges, and again, this is not unique to community colleges, is you have private, not only privatization taking place, but as George said, you have what's called, could be called corporatization. By corporatization, I mean schools being run more like businesses. And students are there to generate revenue, which is like to generate profits for the corporation. Um, the corporate agenda for the community colleges in California is spelled out something called the Student Success Task Force that came out about seven years ago. When you hear the title, Student Success, who, who could be opposed to that? It's got to be a good thing if it's student success. Now they have a new name for it called Guided Pathways, which is both embraced by the state chancellor or advocated by him, advocated by Jerry Brown when he was governor, and City College's chancellor. And they claim that their corporate agenda is a vision for success, and which is student-centered. So you know, again, who could be against policies that are student-centered and that are for, a, for success. You know, we all want that for students. The goals of this agenda include things, as George said, standardize what is taught. So you can do the same thing throughout the state. You take a class like mine, American Government at City College, you're going to get the same thing if you take it off in Santa Monica or in San Diego. And that's beneficial because um, if you standardize it, you don't need as many teachers. You've simplified the whole in many ways, the labor process. It's easily, easy to displace the teachers. Um, more and more classes are being put online. Um, that's the lower cost, since you don't need the physical facilities for online classes. And they can also be used to displace teachers. I envision a time when we're going to have a superstar at a place like Stanford teaching a class that I teach, American government, for everybody throughout the country. And you won't need, you won't need you know, a couple hundred people like myself teaching those classes in the community colleges. You got the superstar. And, and then the, what would exist for teachers is that we'd play the role of answering students' questions and grading their papers and grading their test. Um, how much time do I still have? You have uh, almost 10 minutes. Oh, really? OK. Um, Another way that this corporate agenda is being implemented is in efforts to hold down cost and to get people to do more for less money. So you, what's being happening is you increase the workloads on people, you know, have them teach more and more students per class. You cheapen their costs by hiring part-times and adjuncts to teach most of the classes, which is another trend. It's been going on since uh, probably the early 70s. For students, it means bigger classes, Fewer people to people services, in other words, they won't be able to talk with a counselor. I think at City College, I keep on hearing this thing that students will be able to go online and learn everything they need to know that they don't need the service of a counselor anymore. So more and more stuff will be put online, and I don't have a lot of confidence in how effective that will be. They also are eliminating classes and programs for those who are not young and not seeking degrees, because frankly, from their standpoint, what's the point of helping people to enrich their lives and become more well-rounded and do other outrageous things. The purpose is to get trained so that you can contribute to the economy. If you're 50 or 60 and you're just taking classes, why should we waste money on, what, for, on your education? It's not useful for the society. Um, so the goals of the of these corporate agenda, or the corporate agenda I'm talking about, is to have young students, well, especially young students, to attend full-time and finish quickly. They want them in and out in two years. And for a lot of students, that's not feasible because they can't afford to attend full time. They have to work and they have other responsibilities like family responsibilities. They also are placing a bigger emphasis on students completing degrees and certificates quickly. Uh, I think there's going to be pressure on that. There's going to be financial pressure because part of the funding for the community colleges is now going to be on the rate at which students graduate from the school. So you know there's going to be all kinds of pressures on teachers to herd the students through their classes and make sure you give them passing grades so they can get that certificate. If they're educated, that doesn't matter. Just as long as they finish the classes and get the hell out is what will be the emphasis. Um, Another goal is to have students take fewer classes. I guess I've been reading figures that a student can usually get through a community college and get a degree with 60 units, but, but most of them are taking 70 or 80 units, and they want to cut that down. 
so that they don't waste their time taking classes that they may not need to get their certificates. Uh, I mean, the, the guided pathways, the idea is that they'll have a program laid out for them for their two years, and they're to take those classes and then just get the hell out of the place afterwards. Um, the other goal of the guided pathways is for um, students to gain employment in their fields of study. Great thing. You know, I think that we should want that for students who are attending school. The question, though, are the jobs going to be available? I have my doubts. And I see that what they're doing is they're training students for a lot of fields that may be, the labor cost may be very high, and that results, when you overtrain people, you have a glut on the labor market, and you can keep costs down, and our, our wonderful businesses will be even that much more profitable. There's, there's a dog, you know, dog fight dog effort to get these jobs. That's partly what's going on with teachers in higher ed. I mean, I'm an adjunct or part-timer. You know, people are so desperate for work that they're willing to put up with the crappy pay that we get, the lack of job security, that you don't know from one term to the next if you want to have a job. In fact, you can be thinking of a job one term and you can get bumped or you don't get enough enrollment and they kick you out of the class. So um, that's what they love. They want people who are, the, you know, the people that they don't need to hire full time. Um, there's a fight back against this, and we're seeing this in the fights against charter schools and privatization. Um, there's certainly questioning of the student loan industry, because in order for students to attend full time, they got to borrow, many have to borrow lots of money. Okay, thanks. And, you know, there's also calls for eliminating student debt. You know, all these things are, would be great. Um, probably the biggest manifestation of the resistance is the strike wave across the country. And this is a start. I, you know, mo thousands of people have been mobilized. I would say so far, but it should be a reason not to continue. They haven't been too successful in terms of, say, something like pay. I don't think many of them are getting pay settlements that even enable them to keep up with inflation or the increases in cost of living. And even with the slight pay increase they're getting in Oakland, most of the teachers aren't going to be able to afford to live there still. And one of the problems with some of these settlements that I've read, I know this is the case in Oakland, is that the settlement that the teachers got came at the expense of staff and others working there. And that, that's terrible. And you can't allow that to happen. In other words, in fact, in Oakland, when they voted on their contract, I found this astounding. 42% of those voting were opposed to it. They wanted to continue, that to me means they wanted to continue the strike. 42%. I mean, that to me, is, that kind of opposition is almost unheard of. Um, and, and the other things that they get, well, they get temporary efforts, you know, there's efforts at reduction of class size that's been skyrocketing, but they're pretty minimal reductions. Um, they get temporary moratoriums on closures of schools and on growing charter schools, again, it's just temporary. I think in Oakland, they were going to close schools until August or something like that, and then they're going to start closing them afterwards. You know, that's, that's not a, a victory. Um, you know, the other thing about the fight back, and maybe John will talk more about this, and he may not agree with me, is that there is a fight. There are teachers going on strike, but there's a big obstacle in the room, and that happens to be many of the union leaders and the bureau union bureaucrats who work very closely with the Democrats, and they make big efforts to contain and control and settle these strikes and prevent the further disruption. And we see this over and over again where they come in to, to um, push through quick settlements so that things go, continue on quite smoothly. And that's unfortunate. Um, I guess if Madeline's not here, I mean, I'm very interested in hearing people's questions and what people have to say, those of you out there. Um, yeah, I know, after, I know John will go before that. Um, so we're hoping we'll get some comments from you. I was asked if I can talk more about City College. So if you have questions specifically about City College, I'll try to address those. But thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, well, well, wait, uh, wait, John. Wait, John. Um, we're waiting for uh, Ma Madeline Mueller, who is uh, still uh, caught in traffic, and uh, it actually has to do with privatization. Because for everyone who knows uh, San Francisco, they're building a new stadium. Do people know about the new uh, Warrior Stadium here. Uh, it's wonderful, except that there's no mass transportation. So this is a total gridlock in this area, <laughs> and the police have blocked the road. And now she said the last report she's going west. So uh, on her way here, but I, I think it's the chaos of 
of developers really running the development instead of the needs of people and, and the public. In any event, our next speaker is John Holmes, and John is a member, uh, recently elected member of the Executive Board of Peralta College Community District. Uh, he also is a member of the Communication Workers Pacific Media Workers Guild, uh, which CWA, which represents the journalists, uh, typographers who are retired, and other media workers. So welcome, John Holmes. I really regret Madeline not making it here. I hope she makes it here sooner or later. And one reason I regret it is because she's a great expert on a lot of the uh, nuts and bolts details of privatization, and I was hoping that I could simply say, well, Madeline already talked about that, Rick already talked about that, but I'll probably end up doing that anyway in the theory that Madeline will get here sooner or later. Uh, actually, before I go any further, I should ask a question. How many people here work for or are students in community colleges? Or retired. <laughs> Re or retired. How many people are actually uh, teaching at the moment? Yes, we have some actual instructors. Excellent. Uh, in the Peralta District, perhaps? No, South Orange County Community College District. Ah, come from a good distance. Uh, well, welcome, uh, welcome to the Bay Area. And I believe we have at least one person here who is uh, working for our union. Where did she go? We have five, actually. Yes, excellent. <laughs> Glad to see you all. Glad to see you all. And, uh, okay, I should say, uh, I teach at Merritt College, the proud home of the Black Panther Party, which I find a much preferable place to teach at then DVC San Ramon, which uh, Rick already discussed, uh, School for the Rich. Uh, they sort of ran me out of there, but I was very glad to go to Merritt. And what I want to talk about, uh, okay, so I'm, I'm the person here as the union representative. I'll be talking about what the unions are doing and what they should be doing about. Before I do that, I want to give just a little bit of some overall kind of nationwide background, kind of supplementing the things that Rick and uh, George have already said. Uh, trying to get more nitty-gritty towards uh, what's going on. To understand what's going on in education, you have to remember the aftermath of World War II. The United States of America, the great winner of World War II, was on top of the world, economically, militarily, culturally, and in every other way. This made possible a huge expansion of college education. And in the 60s, led to the opening up of public education, with uh, moves towards, in fact, uh, with student rebellion, moves towards student control, starting with the free speech movement at, at UC Berkeley, which I'm sure a lot of people here remember, right? Uh, what's, so what was going on in the two-year colleges? You saw, actually, if anything, a, in the 60s, and uh, at least in the 60s, a reduction of the corporatization of what at one point were called junior colleges, with almost a purely vocational emphasis. Uh, turning them to community colleges, more like the four-year colleges, uh, where students were going on strike, uh, taking over buildings, and trying to redirect educational programs in various radical directions during the 60s, something that uh, hopefully uh, people in this room, uh, many of you are uh, old enough to remember that. Anyway, but then what happens, the United States loses the war, won World War II, loses the Vietnam War, and it's essentially been, da it's essentially been downhill for America ever since, especially including in education. Expenditures on public education are in a downward spiral. Here in California, as many of us know, there's less money spent on uh, education uh, than on those prisons that Rick was talking about, okay? Uh, and the high schools are, in some places, are like prep schools for prison uh, in the minority communities. But, uh, so, and tuition hikes began, even at the community college level, and the community colleges start uh, to turn away from being general educational institutions uh, towards going back to being vocational schools fitted to the corporate needs of skilled employees, as Rick was, and others were discussing. Okay. Uh, and so you get STEM. I was hoping that uh, Madeline, do people in here know what STEM is? Uh, it stands for uh, science, technology, engineering, and God, I can't remember what the M stands for. Mathematics, Mathematics yes. Uh, so you have a big emphasis on STEM. Uh, and uh, because that's where the jobs are, right? And that's what the companies need, as opposed to liberal arts, okay? Uh, there is, uh, okay. So we've got a deindustrializing America uh, who, since the Vietnam War, whose control over the rest of the world has been steadily diminishing since 9-11 and since uh, two more losing wars, Iraq and Afghanistan. And we're really still just coming out of the Great Recession of 2008. 
Now, given U.S. domination of the world economy, most other countries are actually even worse off than the United States is. Okay? But that's, no consol uh, that's really not much consolation for the ever more ground down American lower classes. The American empire, which looked like it was completely ruling the world in the 90s, after the Soviet Union collapsed, America won the Cold War, uh, some prof was talking about the end of history. Nowadays, when people talk about the end of history, they start thinking about nuclear war, environmental catastrophe. But back then, Professor Fukuyama meant something different by the end of history. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so America is now in pretty big trouble. So the powers that be in this country are steadily becoming less and less interested in educating the population and more and more in keeping them in line. So the community college are, more, are less and less about enabling the students to think about America and maybe even who knows what's wrong with it, what the student radicals wanted in the 1960s, and more and more about making them cogs in the corporate machine, what Mario Savio denounced in his famous speech, uh, keynoting the free speech movement. You all know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so I'm speaking here as a labor representative for my newfound position as a member of the Executive Committee of Peralta Federation of Teachers Local 1603, the Alameda County uh, College Instructors Local. So I want to talk now about what the unions are doing about corporatization and also what they should be doing. Firstly, what are they doing? And the answer, I'm afraid, is really not much. The faculty unions naturally tend to look at the, uh, everything from the point of view of paychecks for our members, right? So they don't object to, to STEM at all, because although it loses jobs for history instructors like me, it, gains, it means more jobs for people teaching science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So whatever. Uh, they don't really think that much about what it means for the students, except that in terms of helping them get jobs, which is also what the corporations want, right? Uh, uh, nor do they make too many waves against changing the fact of the evaluations game. Rick, did you talk about that, or did I miss that? Uh, well, you have this whole system for evaluating uh, teachers in which you uh, fill out all these forms and uh, the students answer questions and the faculty. Uh, anyway, it's this whole system. It's sort of the equivalent at the community college level for uh, in the high schools of teaching to the test, uh, which, uh, in other words, which uh, teachers are compelled to teach students to memorize uh, instead of actually learning something so they can pass the test so they can get into college. So it's sort of the community college equivalent, which is all I really uh, plan to say about that. Though I should note that uh, at City College, the CCSF local tried to more or less take a stand against that and resisted uh, teacher evaluations, right? At least at one point. And uh, so as a result, that was actually one of the reasons that was given by, uh, hey, they're not evaluating properly uh, for the attempt to decertify CCSF. Okay. So, uh, the faculty unions have, however, been fighting against Jerry Brown's idea of a statewide online community college, not least because it easily turned out to be non-union, right? And it would definitely take jobs away from us existing online instructors, such, you know, uh, such as myself. So when my union participated in the statewide education union rally in Sacramento in May, in conjunction with the Sacramento teacher strike, the main issue we were lobbying against was that online college. Okay, that was what we were emphasizing. In general, I have to say, the labor officials, bureaucrats, and all unions, and especially the faculty unions, uh, tend to result to what I see as futile reliance on lobbying the Democratic Party, on which huge amounts of monies, uh, dues money, have been wasted, which could have been used to organize the unorganized and build up strike funds, instead of the militant methods that built up the unions in the 1960s. So what about online education in the community college is something I myself have all too much knowledge about. I was pushed, kicking and screaming, into teaching online over repeated objections and complaints. Okay? Basically, online classes are great for Harvard and Yale, where you have thoroughly self-motivated students. Right? Uh, at the community college level, they do have a place, as many students, including many of my own students, uh, work full time and can't make it to campus. So it has a role. But basically, community college students, well, except maybe at DVC San Ramon, are often non-white, often poor, uh, and uh, often from high schools in minority communities, like Oakland, that are greatly, grossly inferior to the schools for white people. They need much more direct day-to-day -day support from instructors than online classes can provide. 
And if you have statewide online college, the distance between the instructors and the students is even greater. And the situation for students from, pardon me for using the liberal euphemism, an underprivileged background is even greater. And essentially the idea of the emphasis on online colleges is to have a bridge for the very best students in the two-year uh, colleges to get into the four-year colleges. And to some degree to hell with everyone else. Okay. Now, okay, what to do about all this? We community college instructors are taking the brunt of corporatization, but so are the students, their parents, and blue and white collar workers in the, uh, at the college as well. So what's to be done? So we have this nationwide uh, wave of teacher strikes, which is actually threatening to expand to the community colleges. In my local, I think the fact that I'm now on the executive board has something to do uh, with the fact that a lot of instructors, and including our officers for that matter, uh, in the aftermath of the Oakland teacher, uh, teacher strike, uh, have started thinking about the possibility of a parole to teacher strike. So we have a contract action team, which I'm involved in, uh, which uh, we're trying to mobilize the members and mobilize other people to get ready for at least the possibility of, uh, of a strike, okay? Which would be the first time in the history, as far as I know, of the Peralta district. I don't think we've ever struck before, okay? Uh, uh, by the way, I, ha I do have some copies. For more details, I have some copies of my election platform uh, with me, which I'll be delighted to give to anyone who happens to want one uh, when this is over. But what I want to summarize, what I, way I'd like to summarize this is that the West Virginia model, which has already been talked about, where the West Virginia teachers put forth demands that everyone else supports, including the other unions, the parents, the students, and in West Virginia, even some of the school principals. That's the way to go. That's the way to have a strike that wins, okay? Uh, and uh, I'll notice that in the Los Angeles and Oakland teacher strike, that's how the unions plan to organize it. Uh, and that's why it is that both strikes were so successful. The problem in Oakland, and from what I hear also the problem in LA, is in Oakland, when uh, the teachers uh, got offered a 12% uh, uh, wage increase, which is actually what the original uh, request was, more or less, given beyond a few tenths of a percentage point, the union jumped on it and said, okay, fine, and dropped everyone else's demands. And in fact, the school board actually said beforehand they'd been saying, there's no way we could possibly afford this. Uh, and in fact, you had a state regulator saying that if, that if the uh, Oakland School Board were to uh, actually give them their 12%, that would be irresponsible to put, uh, put the board back in receivership. Well, the Oakland teacher strike made that impossible. So what did the Board of Trustees do? Uh, they gave them the 12% at the expense, uh, and they said outright, well, that means we're going to have to do all these, class, uh, all these school cuts to pay for it. Okay? That's the model we want to avoid. That's not the West Virginia model. In West Virginia, uh, they were striking for everybody. And that's why it was such a powerful strike. And it was also a strike, I should mention, that went right around the union leadership. Okay, it was a rank and file strike. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, oh, one other thing, I, uh, and, and those, uh, and so the demands that have to be raised also should include demands to fight the growing corporatization of community colleges, which could well, it turned out to be the first step towards privatization. And I should say, we saw that in the Peralta District. Now, people remember uh, the Peralta District is in a whole lot of trouble. So they wanted to sell off a whole bunch of uh, Peralta land to the Oakland A's. People remember that business? Uh, what, and uh, that, which, it was land right next to Laney College. So if you put the Oakland Stadium right next to Laney College, then the flagship college of the Peralta system would be destroyed. I mean, just imagine what it's like having a major sports stadium cheek by jowl with a college. Forget about it. It's a, it'd be a disaster. So at first, the union lead, uh, leaders didn't really want to get involved in it uh, because they figured, well, you know, how are our members feel? Maybe the members are leaning against it, but maybe the other members are all sports fans, right? So uh, we had a member of our executive board who was from Laney who was pushing it strongly, and there's a lot of Laney teachers feeling strongly. So the union had a referendum on the issue. And sure enough, two-thirds of the membership said, no, we got to fight against this. So the un our union turned around and jumped into the fight against uh, the Oakland A's, played it playing a, a quite considerable role, and in fact, the union won and the Oakland A's lost. And that, by the way, uh, put a lot of uh, uh, energy and sales into uh, Peril Federation Teacher Local 1604. And it's a major reason why it's now a union uh, which has attracted, you know, as, as a union has actually done something, that has actually attracted a lot of attention 
uh, more attention from some of the membership than it had in the past. And I, and I think it's a major reason why we can actually think about going on strike. Okay? Okay. Now, finally, the prime necessity for our unions, for all unions, is to break from the Democratic Party. The tie between the Democrats and the unions is the curse of the American labor movement, in my opinion, definitely including the faculty unions. In, thank you. Instead of depending on the alliance with the Democratic Party, the basic strategy of all American unions since the 1930s, since FDR, right? Uh, we need a program going beyond our immediate needs that addresses the needs of everyone and indeed the needs of all Americans in a country that is going down the tubes, to be quite frank, okay? We need a workers' party in alliance with oppressed minorities, blacks, Latinos, uh, all the oppressed, seeking uh, fundamental social transformation. Ultimately, as long as we're still un under a social system in which nothing gets produced unless somebody makes a buck off of it, anything in the public sector like education or health, housing, uh, is a secondary sideshow to be, defend to be dispensed with because you can't make a buck off of it. In short, what America really needs is another revolution. And I'm done. The was that you would attend full time, you would not pay tuition your first year, and maybe it would be extended to your second year. But I know that what they'll say when people say, well, a lot of the students can't afford to go full time, they tell them, borrow money. That's what we have student loan industry for. And that's going to, so there's, you know, that would be another solution. I also want to add to what Steve said about Virginia strike. I understand that a lot of the teachers were Republicans who went on strike. And that, that's important that we keep that in mind, that on certain issues, even people who support Trump will, will support things like a strike or so, on social justice issues. I was always struck, oh, years ago when there were elections where these states that were heavily Republican, they would have a measure to raise minimum wage, and they'd be supported overwhelmingly in Republican states. So that also is another thing to keep in mind. I, I also want to say I was really struck, I didn't know about the Virginia strike, that they wanted to more monitor people's day-to-day -day lives. I mean, that's, that's prolific everywhere. I think businesses are doing that now, where they monitor what their um, employees do off work. And they can see some of this on the social network, but I think they have even devices for doing so where they can follow them. So I think this is part of our brave new world that we're entering into. Um, Steve said I could talk about the cuts at City College. So briefly, uh, during the accreditation crisis when it was losing enrollment dramatically, we, enrollment went down by more than a third. There was a bill by Leno, Mark Leno that provided City College with more money based on what its enrollment was previously. So they got about 20 million extra a year compared to what they would get. Now the administration was supposed to use that money to increase enrollment, but instead they shoved it into reserves. And their excuse at the time was partly, we had to put it into reserves because in a couple of years we won't be getting this money anymore and we'll have to pay for the expenses in a, in a few years. Well, the new chancellor comes in when this money's no longer available, and there was about $50 million in reserves, and he spent about $35 million of it down in his first year there. And then now, and then the second year that he's there, he says, well, we're running a big deficit, and I'm going to solve the deficit. And when he first announced it, I think it was on the order of about $11 million. Harry, do you know the numbers? Maybe not. Um, it was on 11 million, then about a month later, it was something like 30 million. And they had an editorial supposedly signed by the board the other day in the examiner, and they said it's almost $50 million. So in one year, we went from basically having you know, a whole bunch of extra money left in reserves to having this $50 million deficit. So that was used as an excuse to cut 10% of the classes that were offered in 2000, fall 2018 for the upcoming term fall 2019. Some 242 classes were being reduced. The excuse was that we need to save money, so we cut classes. Some of the classes they were cutting were large enrolled classes that actually bring in more money than they cost the school. Let me say that again. They would have classes with 35, 40 students that generate more money from the state than they cost to run. He was even cutting some of those classes. And, and then... Do you have any idea what the break-even number was in the average class? I think about 20 to break-even. 
it, it depends on who teaches it. If it's a taught by a part-timer, it's fewer. If it's taught by a full-timer, it's more. But I, the, the contract is at 20. I think that's a, Madeline, who just came in, who was supposed to be part of the panel, who might know better, but she looks exhausted. Um, so, something like 20. But anyways, he was cutting classes that were large and rolled. But I think his excuse is partly that the funding for the college in the future is partly going to be based, based on how many students get degrees. So if those classes that were large and rolled are not going to lead to students getting degrees, that might be the excuse for cutting them. But then just today, I got a letter from my department chair, and he plans to cut another 200 classes for the fall out of the existing. So that's almost like 20% that we're going to have. And this is guy will be saying he wants to put students first. That's the goals of his policy, he's student first orientation. He'll claim he's a strong advocate for social justice. He's a strong advocate for student success. So like I was saying before, with the, they use this language that is so opposite of what they're actually implementing. It, it's just mind boggling. Now it's not unique to them. The unions will do the same thing. My u local union will say they're for equal pay for equal work which for part-timers we get paid, it really comes down to about 60% of what a full-timer makes per class. And they don't fight for that in their contract negotiations. Now they may not win, but they don't even put forward demands that would lead us in a direction of equal pay for equal work. I mean, I can see them losing out on the demands, but they don't put forward the demands. It means the administration doesn't even have to oppose equal pay for equal work. Let me just finish up because I'm going on about the class cut. So he wants to cut another 200 classes, and part of what he'll say is that we have all these empty seats. Like, if this was a class at City College, you can see there's all these empty seats here. Therefore, that, that doesn't make sense. We should get rid of the empty seats and have you know, have these, all these seats filled. So they want to have every class filled to the gills. And that will mean at the same time that they talk about student equity, they want to have more and more effort towards those what, what are called disadvantaged groups, the black students, the Latinos, Latinx students, and the Pacific Islanders. They want more of them to graduate at the same rates as the whites and Asian Americans do. But how do you have that happen when you have classes that are full of 45 students? You don't have, you lose that person to person contact. But so, I'm going on yeah. Well, they, they are pushing online. In fact, the Democrats just passed a bill in the legislature uh, providing, I think, $150 million for more online classes at community colleges. And this, this, uh, this money is going to a no bid contractor uh, in San Francisco, who's a former girlfriend or partner of Willie Brown. So here you, uh, but be, before we go on, I want to introduce our star, our, one of our star speakers, Madeline Mueller, who is uh, a historic fighter and continuing fighter at, at Community College in San Francisco uh, for public education, for defending community college. Um, yeah, there's always a breaking crisis du jour at City College, as you've heard from Steve, and being a department chair, I, uh, getting the news, more cuts, more cuts, more cuts. We had wondered, there was a, um, usually the fall schedule, which we worked very hard because there were a lot of cuts, is delivered to all of San Francisco households, and it wasn't. And then we couldn't even find it. And finally, one of my students found a boxes and boxes of the fall schedules hidden away under a, a registration table. And then we found some hidden away in um, receiving. Well, I guess I see why they were hidden away, because they're going to all change, I guess. A big surprise. This is what you know, shouldn't happen in the summertime um, when everybody's away. And so we're waiting for that shoe to drop. And as, as Rick was saying, it's just <laughs> It doesn't make sense unless the idea is to destroy the school. And that's what the literature that you're getting um, kind of indicates, the big picture. There's the, the macro and the micro. And the micro is the day-to-day -day crisis du jour, day-to-day du jour is redundant, um, of, of this. We, we all sit around going, but that doesn't make sense. But that doesn't make sense because we're all trying to make the school work and have true student success. And all of these directives coming from on high um, go the opposite way. So for those of us 
and everybody here, uh, who value education. I mean, it's, it's, it's what our brain is for, um, lifelong learning from the cradle to wherever we end up. And uh, it's, it's what makes us human. It's, it's, it's absolutely has to be done. It's the best good in the world. So things that go against it, um, we can't comprehend unless it's part of a pattern to do it on purpose. Now, accidentally messing up the school and doing it on purpose, the same results, um, but I tend to think of that it's doing it on purpose. That the people who are doing this are not making mistakes, because that's what we sort of want to think sometimes about fellow humans. Uh, you just don't get it, you're making, you know, you know here's the logic. They, they don't care about that. There are marching orders from Sacramento. In one of those papers I've handed out, I think I, I indicate it. Um, well, maybe I don't, I'll tell you about it. Um, uh, one of my former teacher's stepmother-in-law was a part of the State Board of Governors, and she said that uh, about four or five years ago, they would have dinners where then uh, Governor Brown and then Chancellor Bryce Harris would try to convince the State Board of Governors that they should run the community college system from the state the way the regents run CSU and UC. You know, one union contract, um, one set of criteria for lots of things and, and a lot of power in Sacramento. Now they've been wanting this in Sacramento since the middle 70s. When Prop 13 first came around, there was a movement, and I, I, I save things, so I have paper trails on all of this. Um, there was a movement from Jerry Brown the first um, to turn the community college and then 114 community colleges um, into a one-size-fits-all system. And I remember I used to be kind of, an, well, I was sort of a lobbyist for 20 years, going up to Sacramento on behalf of the community colleges, especially the music association. And I would hang out with the Board of Governors then and they'd say they didn't want to do this. Uh, 114 community colleges all run as though they're one one thing doesn't, again, make sense. I remember one of the board members saying, well, let's not be a system. Can't we just be a bunch? And so for several, certain decades now, we've been a bunch, but the state really wants the control. Now, in order to get it, was reported back to me uh, from this uh, friend whose mother-in-law was a state board of governors member. Um, the idea was to have no community college more than 10,000 students for, and the direct quote, ease of management. So I think that that is really what has been happening. That's what, the, and it's written up in the Student Success Task Force recommendations from 2011, chapter seven. It's the only chapter that still hasn't been instigated or, or legalized. Same sort of thing, a, a nod to local control, but not really a state board that runs everything, especially the fiscal parts of things. Um, and 10,000 students, yeah, that's why I think the whole ACCJC came after um, City College to reduce us on purpose to get to be manageable. Uh, I was on the um, govern, uh, uh, what do you call it, negotiation team. I belong to a union that's made up of department chairs. And we negotiated three years during the accreditation crisis every Tuesday with adversarial um, opposition. And we were always told that we should have a smaller group of department chairs for, you guess it, ease of management. So that phrase does ring consistent in what's coming down from Sacramento. And that's the microcosm, but the macrocosm, which I tried handing out to you, is how it's being done uh, very systematically by the, the big corporate folks and also the big, big money, student loan money uh, through Lumina. Uh, corporate, of course, the Koch brothers and all their oil stuff control ALEC, American Legislative Exchange Council that, that uh, puts out boilerplate boilerplate and toxic <clears throat> legislation, especially aimed to 
bring down higher education, especially aimed to get rid of community colleges which are affordable <clears throat> so that students will be forced if they have any aspirations of getting a degree to go to a very expensive private kind of college. And we know in the arts this is especially a target because people really want arts degrees and they will pay a lot and they'll come from many countries. Uh, I know that we have just the most spectacular um, art department, visual art department in, in anywhere in the region um, and yet the Academy of Art and the Arts Institute and all the various for-profit arts people really, really don't want City College to exist and be competitive with, with their clients who are paying. I think the last time I saw it was about, for a degree, $100,000. And of course, probably having a student loan and that whole in, indentureship of our, of our youth comes from that. Um, what I brought with me today was a sort of a, a chronology of some of these things, starting with a, a piece I wrote in 2011, where I got onto Google for the first time and sort of went, oh my goodness, um, there's, there's a trap out there. There are a lot of really negative people towards education. And I wrote it up and it made a bit of a fuss and it headed off a few things in, in 2011. I am always surprised that it still reads very current. And, but now, when I wrote it, people thought I was really nuts. And now they don't. <laughs> I was the conspiracy queen or something. Now they say, oh, you know, it wasn't a conspiracy. It was a business plan, wasn't it? Um, and so every now and then I reread it, so I'm passing it out to you. It's called Connect the Dots. Uh, and you can reread it, or read it, if you haven't read it before. Um, I'm, I'm, I really think it's awful that it's still current, because it has some terrible things in it, including the, the trap with student loans, which I could tell, um, has really, and it continues to increase suicide rates among young people, especially in the early 20s, who find themselves trapped, and they know for life, in impossible situations. And that's, that's just horrible that something like this is, you know, causing people to have absolutely such despair that they, that they can't live. Um, and that's getting worse. Um, and I, I mentioned that because it was already, you could see it starting to happen in 2011. Then um, I think, because I don't have them all here, but I think I, I <clears throat> in the next order, that was 2011. And then in 2013, some students at City College in a magazine we call, et cetera, uh, wrote an article about Lumina. Uh, they were given a, an, a prize. They did very good research. And that's, I hand it out to you. And then in 2017, there was a very good article from the CFT, is it the CFT? Uh, perspective, um, yes, <clears throat> magazine that went out <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that also gives a lot of detail about this, this horrible, horrible um, foundation, they call it, Lumina, but it's not really. It's just the um, way that <coughs> the student loan money, Sally May, launders its ill-begotten profits. And the big, the big focus of Lumina is, in fact, to bring down higher education. That's what they spend their billions on. And to entrap students into um, indentureship is really what it amounts to. Uh, so there are those three articles. And then there, oh, and one by Dean um, Mir Mirakami. What is his, do you know his name? Mirakami, he's at, oh, no, he's at Los Rios. Anyway, it's 20, a 2018 article, I think. And he, is, he gives nice outlines of the names of the organizations that you all should Google and keep track of as, ah, that's what I need. Ah. Yeah, that car got hot. <clears throat> um, and, and then, as I say, everything I could tell was happening almost 10 years ago, it's still happening. And then the final thing of that set that I handed out, at, and I saw the title. Oh, there it is. 
It says, the corporate plan to groom U.S. kids for servitude by wiping out public schools. And you got to read this one. It is, a, it is really something. Um, the most recent, some research, somebody has researched for the last 10 years or so and came up with no surprises to me. Um, and it is something, now that we know that our current president and his deplorables, um, it's, it's out there, it's real. And it, there is a real danger of, of turning America into a, a third world country. We'd, call it, with the haves and the absolute have-nots. And then the education is where, as this article research tells you, it's compromising education that's going to make that happen, the ones who want it to happen. And it outlines what the ones who want it to happen will do. Um, they'll cut classes. They'll put a lot, really force classes to go online. As a department chair, I was given a budget no ifs, ands, or buts. Just here's your budget, and if you want to keep your courses, here's the number that will have to go online. And I didn't have teachers to teach them online. But I had to sweet talk, cajole, threaten uh, some of my faculty just for survival till we can maybe get a handle on this. So four of them have gone through training. They're not happy campers. They don't really believe in this at all. There are so many problems, but it's survival because we're being forced down this track, mandatory online. Uh, they do a lot of good training, and we try to do as we will do, as good as best as we can, but that's not the point. You know, the point is that it shouldn't be, because the face-to-face, -face, especially in our music classes, we feel very strongly is the better modality. It just is. Um, so you see the listing of what, what the forces are doing to downsize and destroy schools. Um, and it's exactly what I heard when I was coming in the door that Rick was saying. It's exactly what's happening, attempting to be happening, and it is happening because we're forced at City College. That's the microcosm. And then the, the last thing, and I, I'll just hand this out after, I sent it in to, last night. Um, a letter to um, be published in a neighborhood newspaper, and we hope to get to a lot of the newspapers, that deal with the, the takeover of land, which is also part of it. I, I always knew it was to entrap students. I could sense that. Um, but people would tell me, yes, but it's the real estate, Madeline. And especially in San Francisco, City College is absolutely at the core of having its real estate attacked and joining forces with these other folk to make it happen. So I'm going to give a copy of that letter, which has a, a request for you all to look out for the environmental impact study that's coming up. This is about the lower lot that City College has used since 1946 as part of the campus. And it's being, we, well, it may, it's in the process of possibly being uh, given over to a private developer, privatizing public land, and um, having up to eight, eight story towers, condo towers built uh, on 17 acres. N hardly any security for water, certainly no fire security, and just no parking, which for a commuter college is, <laughs> that's gonna make things a little tricky. And then they say, well, use, use uh, Muni or BART, which we know are at capacity right now. So another 27, 30,000 students in that system is not going to work. So I have that as the final letter that I will pass out to you. And thank you for <laughs> putting up with this. And, uh, but there's something else too. It isn't just the interaction with the teacher in the class. It's the interaction of students with each other and seeing people who are different than themselves. Um, otherwise, and I, I kind of, I really worry about that because now with phones and everything, people are not, are walking around the street in their own world, you know. Uh, so, but there just seems to me there needs to be venues where people have to come face to face and talk with and see other people. Um, 
And so this totally, you know, freaks me out to think of an online course, like you said, a superstar reaching everybody in California. I, I wonder if any one of the, yeah. yeah. It's an isolating experience, and that's, and that's just this, uh, the reality of it. And I, I, I do my best, I'm sure other online instructors do their best, but no matter, there's no way you can replace personal contact being in the same room, and that's just a reality. Uh, one more thing, I'd like to just say a word or two about Peralta. We've heard from Rick about, uh, uh, from Rick and from Madeline, uh, just one or two words about uh, Peralta. The thing about the Peralta district, it's in a per, uh, perennial forever uh, budget crisis. Part of that is due to a very uh, long history of very poor management, uh, which I could go into in great details. But the bottom line reason isn't just because the manage, uh, management problems of Peralta. The reason is very simple. Uh, Peralta, the Peralta Community College District, just like the Oakland School District, teaches a student body which is uh, very largely black, Latino, minority, Asian, non-white and not necessarily very prosperous. It's not like DVC San Ramon, where I've also taught. So therefore, that is why the Peralta school, uh, school system, just like the Oakland school system, always gets the bad end of the stick and always gets underfunded. And, and so that's only compounded uh, by the lousy administrators we've had. The, the current chancellor essentially got driven out uh, by uh, the faculty and so forth. But the bottom line reason is because uh, of the student body. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of rich people moving into Oakland, uh, but guess what? Their kids don't go to uh, Lady College. They go to UC Berkeley. We've talked about the mac mac micro level, and Madeline talked about the macro level, and Rick talked about capitalism in general. I'd like to give a bigger picture of what this is about. Um, and it, 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 it's related to capitalism at the core. And the fundamental drive of capitalism is to make profit. And uh, in a more theoretical framework, it's uh, the drive for capital accumulation, uh, which is more than money, it's, it's wealth. And what we've seen in the various stages of, uh, of ideology, corporate liberalism, neoliberalism, et cetera, we've, be, we've seen specific capital accumulation models, meaning how uh, the capitalists make money. And certainly from the 40s, 30s, 40s, into the early 70s, the driving propelling industry of uh, capital accumulation was the automobile industrial complex. And all of the uh, elements that fit into that, including suburbia, highway construction, glass, aluminum, steel, oil, et cetera, et cetera. We all kind of grab a picture of that. And starting in the late 1960s, what we see from a Marxist theoretical position is the falling rate of profit on for corporations. And so corporations had to find a new way to accumulate profit. And so there was a specific transition through the 70s into the 80s to kind of uh, develop a new accumulation model. At the core was uh, deindustrialization, as we're all familiar with, where we see the shift of production to the non-union South and then into the third world, et cetera. And to kind of speed this up a little bit, the current, and when I say current, the last 25, 35, 40 years, the dominant accumulation model is fundamentally uh, speculation, outsourcing, military spending, and privatization, okay? And that's how capital makes money. Now, what we also see are subunits in this capital accumulation process. Now, we're all familiar with the military-industrial complex, and we have an understanding of what that was about. It was a way to have guaranteed profits for the arms producers, and that continues to today. Uh, we have other complexes. We have the prison industrial complex, and we have the border security complex, which nobody talks about as well, and that's all about monitoring, policing, militarizing the, the border. What we have is an educational industrial process, uh, complex as well, which is aimed at sucking up as much capital as possible from the public sector. 
Now, what's so lucrative about this is on annual, annually, there is about a trillion dollars a year spent on public education. So everything that we've been talking about is aimed at sucking as much of that capital into the uh, educational industrial complex, which consists of material providers, Pearson textbooks, computers, uh, construction, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I've made my point. Yeah.